Hey guys, welcome back. This is Pastor Jay. Welcome to Intelligent Faith 315. We're continuing on today with part six of our lesson, Has Science Eliminated the Need for God? We're just going to continue right on where we uh, need to be today. We've already covered two reasons why we are claiming that science has not killed the idea of God, why science has not eliminated the need for a creator God. Reason number one was the scientific founding fathers. But let me, actually, let me just rewind and uh, show you our, our outline here. Reason number one was the scientific founding fathers, that they were largely Christians and theists. And I encourage you to watch the episodes on uh, those classes. We talked about men like Louis Pasteur, Albert Einstein, Michael Faraday, James Clark Maxwell, Galileo, Nicholas Copernicus, etc. That uh, the vast majority of the founders of the modern scientific movement were largely Christians and theists. That was reason number one. Reason number two, uh, which we just covered in the last episode, is the claim of scientism is largely a self-defeating idea. Scientism is the claim that only those ideas about reality, which can be verified through the scientific method, namely the language of physics or chemistry, are acceptable and meaningful. And we discussed reason number two, that scientism is a self-defeating, self-contradictory idea. And reason number three that we'll get into today is that there's simple irrelevance, that 95% of science has simply nothing to do with the truth claims of Christianity. It's simply irrelevant in a lot of cases. And then about 5% of science is relevant, but strongly supports the idea of belief in a creator God. So I'll just fast forward, and as I said, we're going to be continuing on with reason number three today, that 95% of science... Uh, is simply irrelevant to belief in God. Most scientific discoveries have little to do with belief in God. For example, do these scientific uh, facts affect your belief or my belief in God? Uh, let's just examine this. The structure of a water molecule, that it's two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Does that fact, the structure of a water molecule, should it affect or must it affect a person's belief in God? No, absolutely not. What about the process of photosynthesis? That plants are able to take um, energy from the sun and uh, have go through this photosynthetic process and produce sugars and release oxygen. Does the process of photosynthesis and its study, does that affect belief in God? No. If anything, I think it would lend towards the belief in God through this complex process that's developed in which evidence is designed, but it's not really that relevant directly uh, the, the different cell types in the human body, uh, eukaryotic cells, prokaryotic cells in the human body, does that, does that directly affect belief in God one way or the other? Not necessarily. Again, I think if it did, it would definitely point towards design. Now, the structure of the cell is just an amazing, amazing uh, microscopic machine. Absolutely fascinating. Or what about the number of DNA nucleotides? About the three billion pairs of nucleotides in the DNA molecule? No. And so simply to say that most scientific facts really don't have a direct impact on belief in God. And so this is interesting because whether you're an atheist, a theist, a naturalist, a materialist, an agnostic, whatever the case would be, or if you just hold to some kind of different worldview or different faith, well, you can still pursue science because a lot of the areas of science don't directly affect theological truths in one way or another. Some of them do, and they do lend towards this belief of design uh, and intelligent construction and engineering. But in one sense, it's important to point out that about 95% of science, uh, the structure of water molecules and so forth, the number of nucleotides in the DNA molecule doesn't directly affect uh, this idea of God's existence or not. So that's important to take into consideration. And in that sense, uh, scientific investigation is not antagonistic or contradictory to belief in God. So that's reason number three. Uh, interesting, reason number four, moving right along, is that 5% of science is very relevant and strongly supports belief in God. The evidence of major scientific discoveries points powerfully and persuasively to the existence of God. And so there are fascinating and very powerful foundational discoveries that have been made in this century alone that incredibly support belief in a theistic creator God. And this is reason number four that we're going to be covering today. And I'm just going to cover a handful of these discoveries, but they are foundational 
and they are important. And I would encourage you uh, to think about this, that if you do believe in the discoveries that I'm going to talk about, you need to weigh uh, the, the strength of support that they give towards a designer, a creator behind physical reality, behind the universe. For example, uh, what kind of scientific discoveries are we talking about? Well, reason number one, evidence one, would be Einstein's equation. Okay, E equals MC squared. Basically, the world's most famous equation. Einstein's world-famous equation demonstrated that all of space, time, and matter, and energy, basically the physical universe, had a definite point of beginning in the finite past. It has since become the foundational cornerstone for modern physics. And so E equals mc squared, that energy equals uh, mass times the speed of light squared. It, it means many things and can tell us much about physical reality, but one of the hallmark discoveries in it, and if you don't believe me, just research it for yourself, but E equals mc squared does point to a beginning of, of the space-time universe. And therefore, the idea of the Big Bang has arisen that there is a beginning of the universe in the finite past. Even if you believe in the multiverse, it still points to this idea of a beginning of the physical universe a finite time ago. So it's not eternal, it has not been here forever, and it, it came out of nothingness according to this discovery. And so E equals MC squared uh, does point to a beginner. It points to a creator. There was a point of beginning. What began it? Where did it come from? What was the origin of that? Nothing produces nothingness. But we know that all of space, time, matter, and energy a finite time ago came out of nothingness. And so uh, no wonder that Albert Einstein himself believed in a creator God. And we'll talk about this discovery uh, more in depth in the future as we get to the Kalam cosmological argument. But it is a strong uh, evidence, one of five, that supports the belief in a creator God. And this is why Albert Einstein said, as we covered in a previous episode, I want to know how God created this world. He says, I am not interested in this or that phenomena and the spectrum of this or that element. I want to know his thoughts. The rest are details, Albert Einstein. He wanted to know how God created this world. So Albert Einstein, one of the greatest intellects of our time, his most uh, revolutionary contribution to science was this equation. And one of the many things we learned from E equals MC squared is it points to a beginning of the physical universe a finite time ago. Uh, and this points towards a creator. That's evidence number one, Einstein's equation. Evidence number two was Hubble's observation. In 1929, at the Mount Wilson Observatory, Edwin Hubble observed that the light from distant galaxies was redshifted, indicating that they were moving away at incredible rates. This led to the discovery that the fabric of the universe itself is expanding. It is therefore not eternal, as has been thought, but rather had a point of beginning in the finite past. And so this is Dr. Edwin Hubble here. This is his uh, telescope at the Mount Wilson Observatory, and this is kind of a visual representation of what is called the Big Bang, that a singularity happened back here, and then all of space-time and physical reality began. So much like E equals MC squared, and Albert Einstein met with uh, Dr. Hubble, and uh, they collaborated a little bit on their research, and again, his discovery of the universal expansion has to do with, if you, if you would perhaps think of the universe like a film and run it in reverse, and then you would, you would bring it all back together, as, like in a movie, basically, that, that all of time, space, matter, and energy condenses down to a point of infinite density, and this points to a beginning of the universe, a beginning of space, time, matter, and energy as we know it. And so again, where did that come from? Uh, how could everything come out of nothing? Uh, what existed before that? What was its cause? We know that things need a cause to happen, etc. And that uh, an effect, and the universe is a mighty big effect, cannot be greater than its cause. But if a cause is to be greater than the universe, it would have to be a pretty amazing cause. And so right away, we're, we see that scientific evidence Einstein's equation or Hubble's observation point to a beginning of the space-time universe a finite time ago, pointing to a beginning, to a creation of the universe. Evidence number three is a universal fine-tuning. 
Universal fine tuning is a fact. Universal fine tuning is true, and universal fine tuning is a tremendous problem to many atheists, cosmologists, astrophysicists, and astronomers. Universal fine tuning is real, and this is probably the reason why the multiverse hypothesis has been invented, because the multiverse hypothesis is seeking an escape hatch. Why? Because universal fine tuning points to a fine tuner, it points to a designer. Let me just read through this. The amazing discovery of modern physics is that the laws and constants that govern the universe are finally balanced upon a razor's edge to permit life and demonstrate mathematical design. A slight difference in any one of these constants would mean that the end of all complex life in the universe. This has come to be known as the fine tuning of the universe. So for example, some notable examples of mathematical or physical constants would include the cosmological constant, which is the, uh, the rate of the expansion of the universe, the electromagnetic force, the gravitational constant, the strong, the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force, the speed of light, uh, the mass of a proton, the charge of an electron. There are so many quantities that when we assign mathematical values to them, we discover that if they were to change, in one part in a hundred billion, 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 and these actual numbers have been calculated for us, that all complex life would be immediately wiped out. And there are about 30 of these, these physical constants. And what we've discovered is they need to be not just finely tuned individually within themselves, but their ratio to each other has to be finely tuned. And so this just screams design. And the problem of universal fine-tuning is a big problem to an atheist, a naturalist, or a materialist. Number one, why are there any physical constants, period? And number two, why are they so finely tuned in ratio to each other and within themselves? Now, of course, one could cry, this is just a random universe, one of many. But now you're out of science, my friend. You're now, you're, now you're getting into philosophy and into metaphysics because there is no independent scientific evidence for the multiverse, nor could there ever be. And so endorsing the multiverse is not a scientific theory. It is a supernatural or you could say a philosophical or a metaphysical theory because all of the scientific evidence, if you claim to be a man or a woman of science, points to the fact that this universe is finely tuned and it had a beginning a finite time ago out of nothingness. Again, due to Hubble's observation and also Einstein's equation. So these three discoveries alone point very powerfully and persuasively to a designer. And let me just finish by reading uh, some quotes from some very well-known scientists. Roger Penrose, a mathematician and author, says that I would say the universe has a purpose. It's not there just somehow by chance. He is a mathematician and an author, and you can see his academic credentials if you search for them. Paul Davies, a British astrophysicist, I believe he's an agnostic, he says, there is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. The impression of design is overwhelming because something is going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers. That's Paul Davies, a British astrophysicist. George Ellis, a British astrophysicist, has said that amazing fine-tuning occurs in the laws that make this complexity, speaking of life, possible. Realization of the complexity of what is accomplished makes it very difficult not to use the word miraculous. George Ellis, a British astrophysicist, again, pointing to the fact that, that these scientific discoveries point powerfully and persuasively to the existence of God. Arthur Eddington, another astrophysicist, has said this, the idea of a universal mind or logos, which is the Greek word for mind or law, would be, I think, a fairly plausible inference from the present state of scientific theory, not religious inquiry, not philosophical reasoning, but from scientific theory alone, he says that the idea of a universal mind would be a plausible inference from science. So Arthur Eddington, an astrophysicist, also Vera uh, Kistiakowski, an MIT physicist, she says, the exquisite order displayed by our scientific understanding of the physical world calls for the divine. 
She is not a priest. She is not some type of a spiritual person. She is an MIT physicist, and she says that the exquisite order calls for the divine. The fine-tuning screams out for the divine. Arnold Penzias, Nobel Prize winner in physics, he says astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing, one with a very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the conditions required to permit life, and one which has an underlying, one might say, supernatural plan. This is from a Nobel Prize winner in the area of physics, Arnold Penzias, that there are supernatural signatures of design Evidence through science in our universe. Frank Tipler, professor of mathematical physics, says from the perspective of the latest physical theories, Christianity is not a mere religion, but an experimentally testable science. That's fantastic. A mathematical physicist uh, says this, a testable science uh, from, the, from the perspective of the latest physical theories. So uh, we will just... End it with that. I do encourage you to look into this as much as you can, that the, the areas of scientific discovery and investigation that we have thus far point powerfully and persuasively not to the elimination of God, but to the existence of a creator God. That's all for today. We'll see you next time.